All right, uh, thanks very much. So, um, uh, I'm uh, very grateful for the, to the organizers for um, organizing tutorial day. Sorry, I just realized there's a slide bar on. I'm trying to turn it off. Um, great, okay. Uh, so thanks to the organizers for uh, having tutorial day. I think it's a, a really, really great idea. Um, I know it's probably a little bit uh, of a whiplash for folks in the audience because we're all sort of assuming slightly different background and trying to speak to slightly different audiences. But, um, you know, the hope is that, uh, you know, everyone will be able to get something out of some talks and some people will get, you know, something extra special out of a certain talk that's aimed just exactly at whoever they happen to be. So. Um, let me explain the point of this talk. So if you get uh, pretty into category theory, so this is not just, um, you know, knowing the definition of category and functor, but you're like, you know, want to absorb the categorical worldview um, for whatever reason, at some point you're going to start hearing about the Yanate lemma. And the reason is the Yanate lemma is just really the fundamental theorem of category theory. There's a game that I know some category theorists play, which is one, one person's supposed to state a theorem and the other person is supposed to figure out how to prove the theorem using the Yaneda lemma. And it's uh, sort of surprising how often that works. It's just, it's everywhere, you know, then of course it's hidden in other areas of math as well that secretly have some category theory behind the scenes. And um, it's just a really, it's like a magic tool. Um, so the problem with the Yaneda lemma, though, is it's very, very, very hard to understand the first time you see it. It's one of those things that you have to get used to it. And then once you get used to it, you can sort of understand it. And then years after you thought you've understood it, then you like all of a sudden really understand it. So it's a, you know, it's sort of a long, slow process. Um, and it's not something that you can expect to learn in a single day. So you know, the first time you see the Yaneda lemma, it'll be a bit of a mystery, but then you'll see it again and you'll see it again and then eventually you'll get it if, if again, you're so inclined to try and understand the Yaneda lemma. Um, so that, that's who this talk is for, is somebody who wants to understand the Yaneda lemma. If you're um, brand, brand new in category theory and don't yet want to understand the Yaneda lemma, then I apologize, but um, this might be kind of like an eating your vegetables. So. So what's the, the plan for the talk? So the Yaneda lemma, I've warned you, is this very, very abstract thing. And part of what it's so abstract about it is it involves sort of natural transformations, which are a very weird concept. And then there's actually some extra naturality involved in the statement, which is something already about natural transformations. And like maybe there's set theoretic issues that we're concerned about and so on and so forth. But none of that is going to appear in this talk. Um, instead, what I've done is I'm specializing to kind of the most concrete setting that I can think of um, where the Yaneda lemma has something interesting to say and that's the category of matrices. So in this talk there will be a single category that we're going to talk about, matrices, and we're going to see what the Yaneda lemma has to say about matrices and that's the entire the entirety of the talk. So um, there are uh, 17 slides. I'm going to try and go at a pretty leisurely pace. Um, you shouldn't feel shy about interrupting me. We've got plenty of time for that, plenty of time for side discussions. I hope we have a discussion at the end. So, um, so if I say something and uh, you don't get it, and, but you want to, um, just you know, at, ask me a question and um, we'll see what we can do. Okay, um, I guess the last thing I wanna note is uh, there's a, this, this is dedicated to a, a category theorist who um, unfortunately died in September 2017, but who I, you know, had a few years of acquaintance before. This is to Fred Linton, and I'm going to say a little bit more about his role in the story at the very end. Um, right, so let's go ahead and begin. So um, I promised uh, this talk is going to feature a single category. It's called the category of matrices, and so the first thing I have to tell you about is what is this category of matrices? This is the only category we need to know in the talk. So what is a category? So again, um, the idea is it's something that has some objects and has some arrows between objects and then there's a composition law that um, allows you to compose arrows assuming their sources and targets match up and then there's some axioms. Okay, so what is the category of matrices? So um, when you declare a category, you can choose anything at all that you want for its objects. And in this case, I want the objects to be natural numbers. So zero, one, two, three, you know, there are countably many of them. Those are the objects of the category, um, essentially just because 
I said so. Um, so if you're this uh, sort of person who's inclined to be confused about zero, uh, pretend zero is not a natural number. I guess I listed it because I secretly want it to be there, but um, uh, if zero is going to confuse you, just pretend it doesn't exist. Um, okay, so we, we have a category. I've told you what its objects are. They're natural numbers. Um, mostly I'm going to use variables for these natural numbers. So like J, K, M, N, those will all stand for natural numbers, um, the objects of this category. And they're all in orange to just help us uh, remember that uh, they're the objects. So these natural numbers are playing the role of objects in this category and they will be in orange. Okay, so then a category also needs to have arrows. And I'm gonna tell you what an arrow from N to M is. Uh, I've drawn the arrow in a little bit of a funny way. I'll say something about that in just a second, but an arrow from N to M, those being two objects in my category of matrices, is an M by N matrix. So, um, so if you like, th this is one of these uh, locally small categories, if that's a term you're familiar with. Uh, the set of arrows from N to M in this category is the set of M by N matrices. So going from N to M, it's an M by N matrix. And that's just the way I want it to be for whatever reason. Um, you could have picked the opposite convention, but I, I want this one. So we're going to go with that. Um, I didn't specify what the coefficients for these matrices are because it completely doesn't matter, but you should you know, pick your favorite field. So the real numbers, if you like, these are M by N matrices of real numbers. And if you don't know what I meant by that sentence, just pretend I didn't say it. Okay, so I'm trying to define a category, category of matrices. The objects are these natural numbers. Um, the arrows are these uh, M by N matrices, if I have an arrow from N to M. So I need to explain now how to compose arrows. So if I have a K by M matrix and an M by N matrix, so that's an arrow from N to M and also an arrow from M to K. Um, does anyone wanna guess for me what the composite arrow from n to k will be. Um, a way to guess would be to drop a guess in the chat, if you will. Uh, Right, so what I'm looking for here is, uh, so the composite of a N by M, a, a, the composite of an arrow from N to M and an arrow from M to K will be an arrow from N to K. So, so a K by N matrix, absolutely, but it needs to be a specific one. So if my arrow from N to M is called A, it's the matrix A, and my arrow from M to K is, uh, a matrix B, then I need a specific K by N matrix to be their composite. And it's defined by an operation that some of you have identified, matrix multiplication. Absolutely. So, uh, right. So if I have my arrow from N to M and my arrow from M to K, in this category, that just means, again, an M by N matrix and a K by N matrix. I've drawn them in you know, sort of a schematic way over here. And if you have, see your M rows and N columns and your K rows and M columns, you can multiply them and you'll get a K by N matrix and that's the composite. Okay. Uh, I, just because I'm looking at the chat, you do not need zero at a comp as an object. If, uh, so if it makes you unhappy, throw it out. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to consider a, a matrix where one of the dimensions is zero. It's just an empty matrix. There's no data involved. Okay, so the other, another thing you need in a category is something called an identity arrow. So this should be a specified arrow from N to N for any object N. So in this context, in the category of matrices, that should be a specified N by N matrix. What is it? All right, so I'm looking for uh, special n by n matrix, something that I can define for any n. And uh, I mean, answering this question is easier if you remember the rest of the category axioms. So this matrix needs to serve as an identity for composition. So if I composed it with an arbitrary n by n matrix, I need to get that n by n matrix back. 
And absolutely, uh, it's something that's called the identity matrix. This is what it looks like with ones along the diagonals and zeros everywhere else, absolutely. And what's special about this matrix, again, is if I multiply it by an M by N matrix A, I get A again, and that's the axiom of uh, identities. So we also need an associativity axiom. Matrix multiplication is an associative operation. Um, you might remember that matrix multiplication is not a commutative operation. I mean, often it doesn't even make sense to try and multiply matrices the other way around. Um, and this is exactly the behavior we expect in a category. You don't expect a commutative composition law in general. So, OK, so that's the category of matrices. This is the only category we'll need for this talk. It may be secretly sets, but OK, so far so good. So um, just as a quick recap, um, the main components of this category of matrices is the objects are natural numbers like K, M, and N. And an arrow from N to M is an M by N matrix. Oh, I forgot to explain uh, why I'm drawing my arrows pointing left. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is something I learned from one of my PhD students, Slow Klingman. Uh, you know, usually category theorists agonize over whether to write composition in sort of composition order or in diagrammatic order. Uh, if you're familiar with those two terms and drawing your arrows pointing left allows you to have both. So, um, you know, the, uh, there's this thing called composition order that means that I really want to write the composite of A with B as B times A as opposed to A times B. Um, but uh, so I, for, for secret reasons uh, of my own, I really want to write this composite as B times A and it's just sort of less confusing if the arrows go to the left because then everything's kind of on the correct side. It's going to make this M by N match up visually with an arrow from N to M pointing to the left. Um, but anyway, it's just a convention. So, okay. Uh, but no, this is not intended to be the opposite category. This is not, um, I mean, you could consider an opposite category of this, but even though I've drawn the arrow going from right to left, N is the domain of A, N is the source of A, and M is the codomain. So the direction of the arrow still indicates what the source and what the target is. I'm just drawing it to the left. So when I compose, I can uh, kind of write the name of the composite in the same order as it looks visually on the page. That's the only, that's the only reason. So. Okay. A diagrammatic order is what it's sometimes called, um, uh, which essentially means it should look, well, maybe I'll leave that for after the, the thing. Okay, so, um, right, we have this category of matrices, objects are natural numbers, an arrow from N to M is an M by N matrix. Okay, and um, the next, so there, there are two key uh, players in this talk, and one of them is, uh, well, I guess an example of a functor, so I should, I should remind you what that is. So, um, so a functor, the data of a functor is given by a set, uh, hn for each uh, natural number n. Uh, so the, the, the reason it's indexed by the natural numbers is those are the objects of this category of matrices. And then I also need a function between these sets associated to each matrix, or in other words, to each arrow in the category of matrices. So that's the data of a functor. And that data is required to satisfy two axioms, these functoriality axioms. Um, and the first of these says that if I'm looking at the function that's associated to the identity matrix, it's the identity function. So uh, here I haven't indicated in any way what the elements of the set H of N are, but the identity function is the, is the function you can define for any set that sends each element to that element itself. And uh, then the second functoriality axiom is about composition. So it says that if I have a pair of composable arrows, so a pair of an M by N matrix and a K by M matrix, then uh, I could, I have the associated function from HN to HM and from HM to HK. And uh, if I compose those functions, what I get is the function that's associated to the composite matrix. So um, the function the composite function from H into HK is the function associated to the composite matrix B times A. Um, so these are the sort of functoriality axioms. Uh, it would be reasonable notation to refer to this as HA rather than A. I've just declined to do so because it's sort of less cluttered. So it's an abuse of notation that I actually think makes things clearer, but you may or may not disagree. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, great. So what's next? Uh, so the uh, there's only one sort of functor that we're going to consider today. So if you want to forget about the general notion of functor from matrix to set, this is the only example that we'll meet today, and I'll just introduce you to it um, independently. So we're going to call it the K column functor. And K here is, again, one of these objects in the category of matrices. So in other words, it's just a natural number. And um, I mean, a way to think can about I, it. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yep. Uh, so just a notational point. Uh, so when you write uh, the function A acting on uh, H of N, uh, should it, shouldn't, is it better to write H of A because it's a, it's a function uh, that lives in the category set, right? Uh, so it's, it's right. Uh, it's quite common to write H of A here, um, uh -huh. but there's this procedure called abusive notation where sometimes uh, you sort of write something simpler than what it would be the more proper thing to write. So oh, it, okay. yeah, so many people would write H of A for that and mean exactly what I mean here. Um, but um, my view is because of the context, because the name A is now sat over an arrow from H of N to H of M. Uh, mm -hmm. um, okay, all you know, right. It's gotta be something slightly different, but it's essentially just associated to A. And uh, I'm just trying to keep the notation as simple as possible. So. Oh, okay, all right, thanks. Yeah. Um, right, okay, so the, um, and I guess, uh, Part of the reason for the simplified notation is there's, there's really only one example that I'm going to be particularly interested in. And uh, this is an example of what I'm going to call a K column functor. And uh, so, the, so this is the only sort of functor we care about. So if you're unfamiliar with the general notion of functor, um, you're entitled to forget it and just uh, remember these sort of K column functors. And colloquially, what the K column functor is, is it's the set of all matrices with K columns. So that's, that's maybe even a, a more useful way to think about it. So the K column functor is the set of all matrices with K columns. So it's a bit more than that. I mean, really, the K column functor organizes that data in a better way. So the first thing to say is it's really a graded set, meaning for each natural number n, there's a set HKn. That's what I've written here. And it's the set of matrices with K columns and n rows. So if I, if I just thought about the set of all matrices with K columns, it makes more sense to break that up into a set where you keep organize K columns in one row, K columns in two rows, K columns in three rows, K columns in four rows. And that's what these HKNs refer to. So K is telling us we're in the K column functor and N is telling you how many rows we're considering. So really the K column functor records uh, the data of all of those sets. Uh, that's this first bullet point in a functor. A functor is a set for each natural number. Um, but then there's a second bit of data as well which says that for every M by N matrix, so every arrow from N to M in this category, I need a function from the set, in this case of N by K matrices to the set of M by K matrices. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, yeah, if somebody wants to, before I was gonna ask a question, um, but uh, if you wanna ask a question, go, go for it. Sorry, I changed people's settings so they couldn't unmute themselves, but I'll change back. So now you can unmute yourself. But I, yeah, I think generally maybe, well, yeah, go for it. Okay, talk. well, this doesn't strictly satisfy Paolo's criterion for urgency. Um, <laughs> so I, I won't ask such questions again. Uh, but so just a notational question. Uh, if, I, if I want to write down, let's say, uh, so H of N is, uh, and is an object, right? And A is a is a morphism. So, is there a notation for saying that uh, you know H of N belongs to uh, something like OBJ set? Is there a notation like that? Because you know set is a category; it has morphisms and sure, like, that seems like a reasonable thing. And you would just kind of write it like that. H K of N is an element 
of the collection of objects uh, of the category of sets. And just don't worry about set theoretic issues there. So. Okay, so it's not an official uh, convention. Uh, lots of, I mean, I don't know that how many, yeah, lots of people use that notation. It's very common, so. Okay. So um, what I'm trying to introduce you to is the k-column functor. So what we've understood so far is that essentially it's just the set of all matrices with k-columns, but it's better to think of that data as organized as a graded set. And what that means is that, uh, you know, really we're thinking about it as this uh, family of sets, hkn, where that's the set of n by k matrices or matrices with k-columns and n rows. And, um, so that's not all of the data of a functor. So part of the data of a functor is I need a function from the set HKN to the set HKM associated to a particular M by N matrix A. So suppose we've picked an M by N matrix A. Um, can somebody think of a function that would convert an N by K matrix C maybe to a uh, M by K matrix? So I want a procedure using an M by N matrix A to convert an N by K matrix C into an M by K matrix. Uh, yeah, and absolutely. Um, the idea is we can multiply by the matrix A on the left. So if I have C, my K by N matrix, hit it with A, multiply on the left by A, and the result here, since this is an M by N times an N by K, will be an M by K matrix, exactly what I wanted. Okay, so that's all the K column functor is. So if you think about the set of all matrices with K columns and what its natural structure is, um, it's exactly the structure of one of these functors. I mean, that's sort of recording the rows as well as the columns and observing that you can change the number of rows in a matrix while keeping K columns by multiplying on the left by some other matrix. Okay, so that's going to be one of the key players today, this notion of a k-column functor that I'll now summarize. So again, uh, it's given by this family of sets, the sets of n by k matrices. Um, and then we have these functions. So for any m by n matrix, I can convert a n by k matrix into an m by k matrix just by multiplying. Okay. And then the second key player today, and this is, I guess, really the main player of the talk, is something that we might think of as a naturally defined column operation on column functor. And for the category, uh, sort, of, sort of the category theoretic fluent uh, among us, uh, what I mean is just a natural transformation. So a natural transformation from the K column functor to the J column functor, where K and J are two natural numbers, in other words, two objects. They might be the same or they might be different. So a, a natural transformation, that's a thing in category theory. And we're going to think of it as a naturally defined column operation between column functors. Okay, so what is it? So firstly, it, I mean, informally what it is, is it's an operation that's going to convert matrices with K columns into matrices with J columns. Because remember this HK kind of stands for the collection of matrices with K columns. And HJ stands for the collection of matrices with J columns. But it's something a bit more precise than that. So firstly, um, the data of a natural transformation is given by a family of functions for each N. So um, the K column functor really is like the family of N by K matrices. Uh, the J column functor also has a family of now N by J matrices. And so part of the data of a natural transformation, one of these column operations, is it's going to be a function that converts an N by K matrix into an N by J matrix for each N. So you can convert 1 by K to 1 by J, 2 by K to 2 by J, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's a condition. Uh, C here is just the name of a particular matrix. That's an example of a n by k matrix. Um, there's not a functor associated with each matrix. There's a functor associated with each dimension. So the k column functors are associated with each dimension. So um, yeah. Okay, so um, Right, so a natural transformation, again, the data, so this is from the K column functor to the J column functor. The data is it's a family of functions that converts N by K matrices to N by J matrices. But then there's a condition and it's called the naturality condition. And uh, 
um, what that condition says is we have all of these functions involved. So this alpha, remember, is this natural transformation. It's this natural column operation. It converts an N by K matrix to an N by J matrix. Um, but also, whenever we pick an M by N matrix, we get uh, a function just involving the data of the K column functor or just involving the data of the J column functor. These are the functions that multiply by the matrix A. And so what this diagram says is that if I started with an element maybe C of the set in the upper right, so if I started with an N by K matrix C, I could apply the column operation, whatever it happens to be. And when I apply the column operation, I'm gonna get now an N by J matrix. And then I could multiply by my matrix A to get an M by J matrix. So that's starting with an element at the top right and going down and then left in the diagram. Or I could go across and then down. And what that means is I start with my matrix C, I multiply it times A. So now I have the matrix A times C. And then I apply my column operation to convert this M by K matrix into an M by J matrix. And what naturality says is those two procedures should be the same. Okay, so I, this is a weird definition. Um, as I indicated at the start, part of what's complicated about the Yoneda lemma is it concerns natural transformations. And that's a little bit of a weird definition, but let's see what it looks like in some examples, sort of how this uh, naturality condition goes on. Okay, oh, so informally again, um, and the way we'll speak about it, I'm, I'm not gonna say natural transformation very much. I'm gonna say that alpha is a naturally defined operation on column functors. So it's some procedure that takes a matrix with K columns and gives you a matrix with J columns. But it's, I mean, you can imagine a lot of procedures, but only some of them will be natural. And we're gonna to start to see in examples which ones are, are natural and which one are not. Um, so I'm not allowed to, uh, I mean, this procedure needs to respect the number of rows. So that's kind of part of saying this natural transformation has these functions alpha sub n. So it's a procedure that takes k columns to j columns, but it has to keep the number of rows the same. So you might think of other procedures that would change the number of rows. Those aren't allowed. Those won't be considered today. Okay, so let's see some examples of this because I know it's a little bit abstract. So um, an example of one of these naturally defined column operations is some sort of projection operation. But let's, let's just sort of remember what the key points of the definition again. The idea of a natural transformation is it's a family of functions. So from the set of n by k matrices to the set of n by j matrices, and then satisfy some sort of naturality condition that we'll see uh, what it looks like in an example. So um, one instance of a naturally defined column operation, this will be one that goes from k columns to k minus one columns is we just delete the last column. So one example of these column operations is we're just gonna delete the last column. Okay, so I mean, that's certainly an operation. Uh, you have to check a naturality condition though. Some column operations will be natural and some won't. And so let's see what that check amounts to in this case. So, so what the check says is, firstly, let's imagine A is an M by N matrix. So I'm holding on to some M by N matrix in my head. And here I've drawn on the upper left, uh, this C. So this is, this is the matrix C, the N by K matrix that I'm starting with. Um, but I've written it out. This is kind of common matrix notation where I'm representing a matrix by its column vectors. So since C has K different columns, it has K column vectors, C1, C2, et cetera. And maybe a way to think about the matrix and sort of fit it all into a slide is, um, you know, C1 is standing for the whole first column of the matrix. So it's an N dimensional vector. C2 stands for the second column, C3 would stand for the third, and then CK is the last one. So in particular, this operation alpha uh, n, let's sorry, let's go back to the naturality. I've arranged things in the same order as they would be on this slide. So C is an element of this set hkn, so that's an n by k matrix. And what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna see what happens when I apply the column operation, let's go down to here, and then uh, multiply by a. So when we start with C and we apply this column operation, the operation we're considering right now is delete the last column. So that's deleting the kth column. Now I have uh, this matrix like C, but you see the CK, the last column is gone. And then I could multiply by A. That was what these horizontal functions that are part of the data of a column functor do. And the result then is, well, it's A times 
uh, this matrix, A times this truncated matrix with the last column deleted. Or I could go the other way around. I could start with my matrix C and multiply by A. And sort of the way matrix multiplication works is what I get then is, the, is a matrix whose columns are, um, well, I guess I put the subscript on the outside. I could have equally put it on the inside. So AC1, uh, the first column of this multiplied matrix is also A multiplied by the vector C1. The subscript would be fine either way. And then when I map down and I delete the last column, the naturality check is that I need to compare this matrix here um, with this matrix. And uh, you, depending on how much matrix algebra you remember, you may or may not know these happen to be the same. So if I, the columns of this matrix, the first column will be A times C1, and that's exactly what the first column is over here. The second column is A times C2, et cetera, et cetera. So the summary is that this is a naturally defined column operation. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, let's see another one. So another sort of column operation is an inclusion operation. So what it, this is going to be an operation from k columns to k plus one columns and how it works is I'm going to append a column of zeros at the end. So let's check this naturality condition again. So what the operation is this time is it takes my matrix C and I'm going to get a C was an N by K matrix. I'm going to get an N by K plus one matrix by sticking a column of zeros um, at the right. Now, if I multiply times A, what I get is the matrix A times that, whatever that happens to be. Or I could go around the other way. I could first multiply times A, and I get the matrix whose columns are AC1 through ACK. And then I can stick on a column of zeros. That's applying the matrix, the column operation after I've done the multiplication. And again, you can check these results are the same, um, essentially because A times the zero vector is the zero vector. So um, these, two, these two expressions agree. So this is another example of a naturally defined column operation. OK. Uh, so well, maybe I should stop here. Uh, give you all a chance to catch your breath and see if anybody else wants to ask questions. Uh, while I'm waiting, I might. Uh... Yeah, hello. Can uh... Can you give a specific definition for the naturality condition in general? Um, so this, what is on this slide is the specific definition for the naturality uh, thing. Um, so it's a, it's a bit strange, um, but what it's saying is uh, for every matrix A, um, what these arrows represent in this little square at the bottom are functions. So this A is a function. This is the function which is multiply on the left by A. This alpha M is the function that is apply the column operation to, M, to convert an M by K matrix to an M by J matrix. And similarly around the other side, this alpha N is apply the column operation to convert an N by K matrix to an N by J matrix. And this A is multiply by the matrix A. And what the naturality condition says is that the composite of those functions agrees. So if I started with an element, of this set. So if I started with an N by K matrix C and I multiplied by A and then applied the column operation, it gives the same result as applying the column operation first and then multiplying by A. So naturality is saying that you could apply the operation before multiplying or after multiplying and the result is the same, is a kind of high level way to say it. Uh, I this is exactly an instance of the categorical concept of natural transformation. So if you're familiar with that, this is really just a specialization of a very general definition, but that's, that's all that it amounts to in this case, sort of nothing more, nothing less. Um, and maybe just a, a bit of history. I mean, part of uh, the whole birth of category theory uh, was um, Eilenberg and McLean trying to give a pin, pin down a precise definition for this sort of colloquial idea of naturality. You know, there's a sense in certain areas of mathematics that some constructions are natural and some are not. And um, their insight was that there could 
be a precise definition of naturality. And this is what it amounts to in this particular case. So. Uh, yes, I think it compares the action of two functors. That's a nice way to think about it. Um, uh, yeah. um, kind of a out, uh, kind of random question here, but um, could you, is there any particularly sacred reason why we've gone with um, the, a, the K column functor rather than like a K row functor? Could you just switch everything around? It just takes the thing and you yeah. would basically need to move around the horizontal arrows, I think. Because so, then you, yeah. Or you'd be switching around the operations, but it would seem to be, you know, six of these, half a dozen of the other, right? Right. So there's a dual universe somewhere uh, oh. <laughs> where somebody instead uh, defined row functors and gave the entire talk about row functors rather than. All right. All right. So it would be, okay. So absolutely, that's possible. I've just made this choice. So. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cheers. Um, Okay. So what I'm hoping uh, we might be motivated to ask or to entertain anyway, is the following challenge or the following question. What are all of these natural transformations? Uh, so um, what are all of the uh, natural transformations? Um, so, or in other words, um, can we classify all of these naturally defined column operations that transform matrices with K columns into matrices with J columns? So I've given you two examples of column operations. There are a whole lot more than the two that I gave you. Um, there are also a lot of things that aren't natural for one reason or another. Maybe they fiddle with the number of rows or maybe they're nat not natural for some more subtle reason. We'll see an example like that later. So can we understand all possible column operations? So all uh, operations that transform matrices with K columns to matrices with J columns, more precisely, these should transform N by K matrices into N by J matrices, plus do so naturally. Can we classify all of them? And this is exactly the question that the innate dilemma is going to answer. Okay. Uh, could that be another category? I'm sorry? Could there be a category of the natural transforms? Uh, yes, the natural transformations form the arrows in the category of functors. So in this case, the objects would be things like the column functors, the K column functors. Those are the objects now. And the natural transformations are then the arrows. So in particular, natural transformations can be composed. We'll talk about that, uh, in fact, later on. So, so yeah, absolutely. Okay, great, right, so we're trying to do, yeah, some, some of you have some very astute ideas for how we might possibly classify all naturally defined column operations. But I'm not gonna ask this as a question, I'm just gonna tell you the answer because the point is to understand what the innate dilemma is telling you. Um, so let's just go ahead and see what it is. So uh, here's the Yaneda lemma in the category of matrices. So the Yaneda lemma is going to entirely answer this question and uh, give us a very explicit answer. So the, the challenge was to uh, classify all naturally defined column operations that transform matrices with K columns into matrices with J columns. Let's do it. So firstly, what the Yaneda lemma says is that every naturally defined column operation from K columns to J columns is determined by a single k by j matrix. So um, this, is a, this is a bijection. It says that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these naturally defined column operations from k columns to j columns and k by j matrices. Okay, that's all well and good. Uh, I mean, these are two uncountably infinite sets, <laughs> but, but um, the point is you can figure out exactly what that matrix is. So uh, here is the k by j matrix. So it's, it's written in kind of uh, obscure notation, but this is the notation that you will see if you read anything about the innate dilemma ever. So I decided to go ahead and use its sort of full ugly notation because um, part of the point is to remember what this formula is. So, um, so it's gonna be a K by J matrix. In other words, it's an arrow in the category of matrices from J to K. And how do you get that K by J matrix? 
Well, what I do is I take my column operation alpha. Um, I look at one component of it. So remember, a column operation is a family of functions, um, hkn to hjn for every n. But I'm going to look at the component at k, where the k is the same k that uh, is the domain index. And what's special is this is the set now of k by k matrices. And it has a special element from the point of view of the category, namely the identity matrix. So this was the an arrow from k to k that was particularly important to the definition of the category of matrices, this k by k identity matrix. And the claim is that this matrix that somehow classifies the entire column operation is the one you get by thinking of this column operation as a function and applying that function to the identity matrix. So in other words, you start by the identity matrix. It's a k by k matrix. If I apply my column operation, I'll get a k by j matrix. And that's this thing I've written here. Alpha k i j means apply the column operation to the identity k by k matrix. Okay. And finally, so the claim was that the column operation is entirely determined by the single k by j matrix, which you get by applying the column operation to the identity matrix. And how is it determined? So somebody uh, had this intuition already, which is great. So a column operation is then, so the general column operation that converts n by k into n by j is then just defined by multiplying on the right. So that's the other side than we were multiplying before. If your rights and lefts are a little confused, this is the other side and that's important. We're gonna multiply on the right and by this special matrix. So the claim is that all naturally defined column operations are really just given by multiplying on the right by some matrix. And what matrix is it? It's the matrix that you get by applying the column operation to the identity k by k matrix. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah, hang on for the Gaussian stuff. Um, so, so this is the innate dilemma. Let's uh, see. So here's the summary statement again. So uh, the innate dilemma says that every naturally defined column operation, so every column operation that satisfies this naturality condition, is given by right multiplication by a single k by j matrix, and it's the one that you get by applying the column operation to the identity. So that was a summary of the three points on this side. The column operation is determined by just one matrix. You get that matrix by applying the column operation to the identity matrix. This will be my notation for that. It means apply the column operation to the identity matrix. And then the full column operation is just right multiplication. Okay, so let's see what this looks like in some examples. So here's an example of a naturally defined column operation that we haven't discussed yet. It's called, it's a permutation operation. So this is gonna be an operation from K columns to K columns. And let's consider the operation uh, that just swaps the first two row columns. So, I mean, you could imagine a different permutation. Those work in exactly the same way, but let's just to be concrete. So I'm claiming that there is a naturally defined column operation, which is swap the first two columns. So if your columns are C1, C2, et cetera, through CK, the matrix you get swaps C1 and C2 and then leaves the rest of the columns the same. So by the Yanay dilemma, this column operation is classified by a matrix. What matrix is it? You start with the identity matrix on K, and then you swap the first two columns. This is what it looks like when you swap the first two columns of the identity matrix, the ones and zeros in this upper left square get swapped. Okay. And then if I want to implement the operation of swapping the first two columns on a generic matrix C, what do I do? I multiply by this special matrix on the right. That's the, the summary statement of the innate dilemmas. If I want to do implement the generic column operation, which is swap the first two columns, what I do is I first do that just to the identity matrix. And then for any other matrix, I can just multiply on the right by this, this matrix. That's an implementation of the column operation. And it's guaranteed to be natural. Um, uh, I guess I don't have a slide about this, so maybe I'll pause and say it and somebody can ask me to write it out for you at the end. I mean, the reason that it's guaranteed to be natural essentially is the naturality condition is about multiplying on the left, where the column operation is implemented by multiplying on the right. 
And what naturality says is that these operations need to commute, but multiplying on the left and multiplying on the right do commute, essentially by the associativity of multiplication. You can first multiply on the right and then multiply on the left, or first multiply on the left and then multiply on the right, and it doesn't matter. It's the same result by associativity. Okay. Let's see another example. So another instance of a uh, naturally defined column operation is uh, one that multiplies a column by a scalar. Here to be concrete, let's say we're gonna just multiply the first column by a scalar. So um, by the innate lemma, this column operation that multiple, so scalar just means a, like a real number if we're talking about real matrices. So if you, um, so this, this is a column operation that would take the first column of your matrix, multiply every number in that column by some constant, which are called in lambda, and then you return uh, that result in the first column. So again, the innate lemma says that this operation should be implemented by, or classified by a single matrix. And how do you get that matrix? You take the identity and you multiply the first column of the matrix by lambda. So that's the result here. We had, so we took the identity matrix, we looked at the first column, which was one, zero, 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 zero. When you multiply by lambda, you get lambda, zero, 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 zero. And so this is our special matrix. And now the claim is that to implement the column operation, uh, what do you have to do? Um, you uh, take your matrix, your generic matrix, and just multiply on the right by this matrix. The result of that, you can check, is that it leaves columns two through k alone, but replaces the first column by lambda times whatever it had been previously. Okay, so this is another example of these naturally defined column operations, and I'll tell you about one more. So uh, this is some sort of column addition operation. So this is the operation that adds the first column to the second column and then puts the result of that in the second column. So this is an operation that takes a matrix with k columns. It's gonna leave the first, third, fourth, et cetera, through k columns exactly as they were before, but replace the second column by the sum of the second and the first. And uh, the claim again is this is a naturally, if this is classified by a single matrix. You get that matrix by starting with the identity. So one's at the diagonals. And uh, then, um, uh, uh, then what you do is you um, add the first column to the second. So if I add the vector 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 to the vector 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, what I get is 1, 1, 0, 0, which you'll see is what's displayed in the second. Um, and uh, so then if I want to implement this column operation for any other matrix, all I have to do is multiply on the right by this. It'll have the effect of leaving columns one, three, four, five, et cetera alone, but replacing column two by the sum of column one plus column two. Okay, let me pause uh, for some questions. Um, so how about the general linear matrices of size k by k? Right, so each uh, k by k matrix determines a column. So um, this is gonna answer somebody else's question in the chat. So let me start back here. So a column operation, uh, so to specify a column operation, uh, first you need to say how many columns, first you specify the dimension of the start, uh, and also spe specify the number of columns of the start, so k, say, and also specify the number of columns at the end. At the end. Okay. So like part of the typing of a column operation is you know how many columns you're supposed to start with and how many you're supposed to end with. So for instance, uh, for, so for the permutation operations, go uh, from k to k, and there are only interesting ones uh, when k is greater than one. If k is equal to one, there's no way to permute one thing. So there's, there's no interesting permutation operation. But um, each of these column operations is typed by saying how many columns you start with and how many you end with. Um, okay, so sorry that, so um, if you pick any element of the general 
of GLNK, or sorry, GLNR, GLKR, you said K by K. So if I pick a K by K matrix, um, it will define by the Yoneda lemma. Um, let's go back. So by the Yoneda lemma, um, in fact, I don't think I said this as clearly as I could have done. Uh, so um, this first statement is really, it's a bijection. So every single, uh, every naturally defined, so that's a great question. Thanks for bringing this in my attention. Every naturally defined column operation is determined by a single K by J matrix. And conversely, any K by J matrix determines a naturally defined column operation. So this procedure, right multiplication by some matrix, is always going to give you a naturally defined column operation. So that's an example of a naturally defined column operation. And moreover, this is the only example in some sense, every, well, in a precise sense, given by the Yoneda lemma. So every, every matrix gives you a naturally defined column operation, and column operations exactly are given by matrices. Other questions? Um, uh, sorry, I, I don't know how to like make sure I'm not cutting someone off, so I'm just gonna <laughs> speak, I'll speak quickly <clears throat> to help us out. So I'm I'm not super comfortable or, or familiar working with with matrix things. So I'm I'm trying to think of this more generally, so I can just kind of mm -hmm. avoid that problem. <laughs> um, so uh, generally speaking, though, what we're saying is there's a bijection between a mathematical thing that we might be interested in. Mm -hmm. and an operation that might help define it. And that operation, in this situation, we're talking about a column operation, but it could be something different in a different context, right. would be given by that natural transformation composed with the identity on whatever you started with. So we had- Yeah, applied to the identity. Order, yeah, that's right. Identity, yeah. and then, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so, so they're all together compositionally. And so I, I guess the, the question I had, and this is probably because I don't understand the matrices as well as I, I'd like to, is that the the bijection here between that single K by J matrix or that single mathematical thing we're going to talk about in a different context is somehow very closely related to that natural transformation on the left hand side. In yeah. some sense, they're not just randomly associated, but there must be something very close in their connection. Um, I, I'm not going to ask you to come up with some random other example on the fly because I don't understand matrices, but but I think I'm roughly getting the shape of it. It feels like, at least. Right. So, so you're correct that all of this is much, much, much more general uh, than is indicated here. Um, but uh, for expository purposes, I'm only going to tell you about this in this very one special case. And apologies if you don't like matrices, though. So. Not, not to worry. I, not, not, not your fault. Definitely something I can brush up on. Yeah. Cool. All right. Other questions? Uh, um, Sorry, uh, just for some context. Mm -hmm. <sighs> who, who shall I go? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, sure. You're new, so go for it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm loving this so far. I have a question about um, how we apply Yoneda. Basically, I'm used to seeing Yoneda lemma as given some functor defined on a locally um, locally small category. Mm -hmm. Um, the natural transformations from the representable functor given some object mm -hmm. to this given functor, mm -hmm. um, that set of natural transformations is isomorphic to, uh, to that functor applied to this object that we chose. You know what I'm talking about. But I can't see that in, uh, in this statement of the Unida lemma. We're talking about the set of natural transformations from right. one column functor to another. Right. So how is it representable? Sure. So firstly, um, some people use this notation H sub something for representable functors. So it was for people like you that I chose to write column functors this way. So H sub K is the functor represented by the object K. It's the covariant functor represented by the object K. And I think McLean uses this notation. So that's why it's here secretly. So um, I'm going to help you answer your own question. So here we're considering natural transformations from the represented functor to a functor that happens to be represented. So if this is a specialer case than the version you said, but that's okay. So this is the functor F. So the statement you just told me is that it should stand in bijection to taking this functor and evaluating it at the representing object. So in other words, it should be in uh, bijection to the set H sub J of K 
And now you just have to remember what that set was. H sub J of K is the set of, uh, well, K by J matrices. So there it is, yeah, yeah. Cool, good, someone, one person is happy, great, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, question, question? Yep, go for it. Uh, does UNIDA lemma always uh, classify natural transformations or it just happened to be in this case? Uh, great question. So it classifies natural transformations whose domain is a representable functor. I'm not going to define that for you, but the domain has to be something special. Uh, and then it actually applies in even greater generality here. The codomain can be an arbitrary, uh, you know, functor that uh, goes between the same two categories. Um, so, but, but yes, the Yaneda lemma applies in absolutely any category. It's always, always there. So. Thank you. How, how special was it that the, um, that the consequence of the Unita Lemma was a K by J matrix and that, that happened to be that the K by J matrix was an element in this category or an object in this category? Uh, so the, uh, the K by J matrix is an arrow in the category, not an object. And that's, that's true in general. So if you have an arbitrary category and you're wondering what, and you have, so we have an arbitrary category C. I'm gonna pick two objects of that category. I'm gonna call them K and J just so we can look at this slide, but they can represent whatever. So we have an arbitrary category. We have a pair of objects of that category, K and J. So it will always be the case that natural transformations from the covariant functor represented by K to the covariant functor represented by J stand in bijection uh, with the set of morphisms in the category from J to K. So that's what's true in general. And in this matrix context, the morphisms are, um, are just K by J matrices. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I read, I, I think uh, maybe in one of the blog posts by uh, uh, Ty, Ty Bradley, uh, that uh, the Unader Lemma is basically uh, the notion that if you want to understand something, some of some system, mm -hmm. you have to understand how it is associated or viewed from the perspective of all the other systems. Yes. Right. I mean, that's I think what she said. Yep. So, so from that from that point of view, uh, like how how is that manifest in this ex example? Great. So that's, that's a very useful perspective on the Yaneda Lemma, um, it, and it is not at all the perspective that uh, is in play here. Um, so there's a, a reason for that, essentially, which is that the category of matrices is skeletal, um, and that uh, sort of none of the objects are, um, e each object is distinct, you know, no objects are isomorphic if they aren't literally equal. Um, so that perspective is really not so useful in the category of matrices for that reason. Um, why don't I push the rest of this question to the end? I could give you an okay. illustration of the innate dilemma in a different category that would highlight that point of view. Um, so okay. I 100% agree with Ty Dene, but um, that's only one role played by the innate dilemma, and the role played by the innate dilemma here is a different one that I'm emphasizing. So. Oh, thanks. Could I ask a question real quick? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this might be a bad question, but I was just wondering if any of this carried through, if you could somehow look at the category of matrices over vector spaces rather than over natural numbers? Yes, absolutely. Um, for the same reason, let's ask me that again at the end. That's an excellent okay. question. I Thank would you. love to discuss it, uh, but let me hold, hold up a sec. Sounds <laughs> good. Yeah, great. Okay, um, but, uh, but ask that again at the end. I'm putting you off, but I, I want you to ask your question again. Um, okay, uh, Anna, do you wanna ask something too? Um, oh, so you were gonna go on with the talk first? Well, if you ask your question and then I may or may not answer it, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, sure, I was going to ask whether you could put this a bit in the context of representation theory, because it seems very much like how we learned linear algebra in our first undergrad year, like how to represent linear uh, transformations, and then also how exactly it's a generalization of Cayley's theorem. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, with permutation groups and so on. Yep. Uh, yes, save it for the end. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, you're right. There, there are very interesting things to say there, um, but let me not say that right now. Um, sure. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Um, great. So let me, um, for those of you who wanted a break before the next talk, let me just real quick finish up. Um, so uh, we had seen some examples of naturally defined column operations, these permutation operations that swap columns, these multiplication operations that replace a column by a scalar multiple of it, and these addition operations that add columns. And um, those are familiar operations, and I just wanted to uh, sort of connect to something that's in the matrix literature. So there's a consequence of the innate dilemma. Um, so the innate dilemma is itself has some naturality in its statement, which I didn't mention. Um, but the consequence is this, that you can ask whether a naturally defined column operation is, is invertible, meaning if you start with K columns, you start with a matrix with K columns, you do some operation and you get another matrix with K columns, can you somehow invert that operation and get back to the matrix that you started? That's what I mean by invertible. And it turns out the answer is yes, uh, the, the operation is invertible if and only if the matrix that represents it is invertible in the sense of a for matrix multiplication. So it has a, it would be a K by K matrix that has another K by K matrix inverse so that if you multiply them together in either order, you get the identity. So this is a consequence of the innate dilemma. In this case tells us that my matrix operation, my column operation is invertible if and only if it's representing matrix is invertible. And so in particular, your column operations can, can never be invertible, uh, I guess in the two-sided sense, um, if unless K and the, the dimension that you start with and the dimension that you end with are the same, because there are no invertible one by two matrices, for instance. Okay, so um, the elementary column operations that I just mentioned, swapping columns, multiplying a column by a scalar, or adding a scalar multiple of one column to another column, these are all invertible since the corresponding elementary matrices are invertible. So you could check um, the three matrices that I displayed here are all invertible matrices. If you remember how to compute inverses, you could sort of work out what their inverses are. And so therefore those operations are all invertible. That's one thing that the Yaneda lemma tells you. And another thing that the Yaneda lemma tells you is how you could compose these column operations. So we mentioned that natural transformations are the morphisms in some category, and as such, they can always be composed. Um, but we've seen that these natural transformations, these column operations are classified by matrices, these representing matrices. And you can ask, what is the matrix that classifies the composite of two column operations? First do alpha, then do beta. Um, well, that classifying matrix is just given by right multiplication. Uh, sorry, it's just given by the product of the representing matrices. So the, the composite column operation is then right multiplication by that matrix, which is the product. So here, um, this alpha k i k is the matrix that classifies the first column operation. This beta j i j is the matrix that classifies the second. If I multiply those matrices, what I'm going to get is the matrix that classifies the composite column operation. That's what this slide is. Uh, and yes, every, absolutely everything I say is uh, general. So these are all Yaneda facts. I can say them again at the end of the talk in general category theoretic language, if you like. But the point is in this way, you might know that the elementary column operations, so the, the three operations we just discussed, permuting rows, a scalar multiplying or adding a scalar multiple of one row to an, or sorry, one column to another column operations. Uh, these generate all invertible column operations. So all, all of the, um, there was this question before about, um, uh, right, yeah, so this, so it's a fact, I guess, um, this is something you learn, for, maybe if you're learning the Gaussian elimination procedure, it's a fact that all of these column operations can be built from these elementary ones. And uh, if I want to uh, classify them by a single matrix, I can get that matrix by just multiplying these matrices in, in general. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to leave you with was a, a, a non-example. So we can, uh, um, you know, not all things that you might imagine are a column operation are one of these naturally defined column operations. So um, an example is that we could, we talked previously about a column operation that is appending a column of zeros. That is a natural column operation. But if you uh, append a column of ones, it is not. 
So how do we see that? Well, um, by the innate dilemma, if it were a natural column operation, it would be classified by the matrix that you get by starting with the identity. So the identity matrix is this bit on the left, and then I'm appending a column of ones. Um, but then if I write multiply by this matrix, it's going to give you some column operation because write multiplication always gives a naturally defined column operation, but it's different than the one we intended. If we write multiply by this, what it gives is it's the K by K plus one matrix that puts the matrix on the left and then adds all the columns and puts that in the right. And that's different from just putting ones on the right, which was our intention. So this is an example of a column operation that violates the naturality condition that we discussed previously. Okay, so the, the very last thing I wanted to explain was the dedication. So um, I, I first learned about this example that uh, you can use the category of matrices and these elementary matrices to uh, give an explanation of the innate dilemma. And I, you know, I, again, I think it's a very illustrative explanation of the innate dilemma. I learned this in uh, late uh, 2014. I was preparing to teach an undergraduate category theory course. Um, this is, I wrote lecture notes that became this category theory uh, textbook, which you can find on the web category theory in context. And uh, I spent a lot of time thinking of all the examples that illustrate categorical concepts that I was familiar with. Um, but, you know, I knew that if I, ask the experts in the field, um, they would come up with even better examples than I was familiar with. And so I sent an email to the categories mailing list asking uh, for help um, coming up with the best illustrative examples. And uh, this is only part of that email. I sent a pretty long email. Um, but I received this really, really lovely uh, response from Fred Linton. Uh, that firstly encouraged me to get in touch with David Spivak. So that was a, that was a nice suggestion. Um, and uh, then told me this entire story. So he's, he's really the one who should get credit for everything that we've seen here today. And I, I'm very appreciative and thank you also for your time and attention.